and you know everyone talks about supporting farmers and supporting you know buy local and all of that but somehow migrant farm workers who are racialized are you know erased out of the picture and, and when people think of a Canadian farmer they think of a white guy with three or four kids in a picture holding their basket of apples but th that's not it there's racialized there's uh, migrant workers who are being exploited in a farm near you Hey, fellow workers, welcome back to the Alberta Worker Podcast. We are broadcasting from territory of Nitsisapi. You are listening to Season 1, Episode 12. We are also proud members of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. I would like to welcome today's guest, Vanessa Ortiz, a teacher and community organizer. Welcome, Vanessa. Hi, Gim. Thank you so much for having me. You betcha. So happy that you're here. Thank you very much for agreeing to be a guest on the Alberta Worker Podcast. So let's just go straight into it. How about you just share your life story with us? You know, where you grew up, what your family life was like, where you went to school. And then as you're telling us that, just try to incorporate for the listeners your personal labor history. You know, what your first job was, your subsequent jobs, and what you're doing now, and that sort of thing. Sounds great. Well, my name is Vanessa Ortiz. I am an uninvited guest on Treaty 7 territory, where, where we are recording now for my end. I was born and raised in the original territories of the uh, Coahuiltecan nations, which we now call Northern Mexico. So I come from a long line of ancestors who have fought really hard to keep and, and protect teachings and, and knowledge in, in, in our ways. And also shaped by, you know, displacement and, and, and violence that unfortunately neoliberalism and neocolonialism has brought to people in, in the region where, where I'm from. I am a teacher. I was trained in Mexico and I am now a teacher here in Canada. And well, my, my life story is surrounded by labor struggle. I'm the second of, of two daughters in a, in a family of teachers. We're all teachers in my family, all my, my aunties and my aunts and my uncles. That mom and everyone around said teachers so it was just you know meant to be like, there was nothing else ever that you know <laughs> uh, that I thought that would be like I always knew I was going to be a teacher and and I'm really proud to be one that's awesome. And, and yeah, and you know, my mom and dad have always been involved and still are now they're retired now, but they have always been involved in Union of Teachers in Mexico, which is the largest and I would also say most powerful union in all of Latin America, which is called CENTE. And, and you know, there's there's a lot of things about the teachers union that can be said, but definitely the um, history of labor struggle is, is one of those uh, big features of, of our union. So I grew up not even in the suburbs. I grew up in a rural area, kind of close to the city, but still rural. So I had no neighbors and, and everything around me was just, you know, nature and, and kind of like a farm. My dad loves animals. And so that's how I grew up. They're surrounded by, by animals and by, you know, my dad's hobby is always being like planting trees and so you're giving that gift and it has to be like a plant or something <laughs> because that's <laughs> or like a goat or whatever <laughs> so so yeah that's how I grew up and I I went to school at a school called uh, Normal Federal which is the uh, normal school what you know teacher schools um, are called in Mexico and, and in Latin America Escuela Normal and it's a federal school so it's a public school so I'm a product of public education and and that's something that that I hold very close to my heart. And, you know, I, I graduated. And by the time I graduated as a teacher, I had already been working because I've always loved public speaking. And I was very involved as a child in public speaking competitions and all those kinds of things. So I worked since I was very young, coaching um, other children and youth for, you know, public speaking. I'm an English language learner, right? So sometimes my pronunciation isn't right or I struggle to find the right words. And I always you know, tell them like, I'm really smart in Spanish. Like you should hear me in Spanish because, <laughs> you know, it's a misconception that people who are speaking, you know, um, English as a second language and who, you know, sometimes struggle to find the right, the right word are, are somehow, you know, less smart than, than native speakers, right? So I'm like that with French. French is my mom's first language. Yeah. And when I speak French, I speak in a broken French. And so I, I can feel for people who struggle to speak English fluently. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, and you know, it, it's a changing culture and, and, you know, just little things that 
don't have translation, right? Sometimes I'm trying to say something in English and it comes all wrong because I'm just translating literally and it just does not work that way, right? But, uh, and it's part of my labor story too because I can give a little bit more detail and I want to go back to my story as a teacher in Mexico. It has shaped my experience as a teacher here in Canada because although I am trained and like specialized in um, elementary and, and junior high education, somehow because you're an English language learner, your credentials are never good enough, right? Because you're never trusted to teach anything other than Spanish. I'm a Spanish teacher here, right? And so right. it's definitely been a struggle to fight to get out of that stereotype that I, I am only good to teach Spanish, but... Because apparently they don't teach math and science and social studies right. in Mexico. <laughs> they only teach Spanish in Mexico. Right, yeah. <laughs> and and yeah, but you know, I'm very grateful for for all the opportunities that I've had to to live and work here and, you know, raise my young family and there's always something to work on. But anyways, going back to my experience as a teacher in Mexico, well, as I said, like I'm a product of all public education and and that's where my passion is at. I taught several different grades in very marginalized areas. So I'm from a border city in Mexico. We have a coast and we have a border with Texas. So we are right in the corner, northeast corner of Mexico. Being born and raised in a border city in Mexico means that there's a lot going on in those cities, especially the last 15 years have been pretty rough for our people in terms of drug violence. And, you know, unfortunately, geographically, we are located in a place where things happen, right? And it's not necessarily a fault of our own people. It's a worldwide problem. But unfortunately, it's our people who are paying the price with drug violence, right? And there's a lot of trafficking or in, in, in that area because it's a border. So yeah, I mean, my generation was a generation of displacement. Many of my peers uh, left that area looking for for peace, looking for a better environment to raise their family and more opportunities because, you know, my city being a border city as well, there's a long, long tradition of maquiladoras, you know, places where things are manufactured, right? and uh, in big, big, big scale. So most people in my city uh, work as, you know, manufacturers and under pretty rough conditions, right? And American companies and companies from all over the world come to my city and other cities like mine to establish a manufacturing places where, you know, they are paid a couple, three, four dollars a day, right? For a whole day of work. Everything in those cities revolves around manufacturing and so, and, and you know, other like, public service right so it's tough so people people have to leave and others choose to stay but it's definitely you know not an easy situation no one wants to leave home I always tell people that like I'm not here by choice and that's why you know I sometimes I'm, I mention that I'm a product of you know that displacement from neocolonialism because you know when those factories come to our city and to other cities and they claim to be bringing jobs but they're bringing exploitation and very unethical practices speaking of the manufacturing workers you know these american companies they're trying to exploit mexicans so that they can avoid having to give Americans, good union jobs and everything like that. And I think this is one of the reasons why it's important that workers stand together across the world, right? Not just to, it's not, oh, you know, Canadian workers need to make sure we protect Canadian jobs. We should, need, we should be protecting workers around the world because if we make sure that workers around the world aren't exploited at the expense of other workers, then um, it's harder for for companies to do that and they'll realize that it's inevitable that they have to deal with union workers definitely and you know very recently i would say it was 2019 i think very powerful workers movement started in my city it went it was called 2032 that was the movement because they were asking for certain changes in the industry and they were starting their own union it was very famous worldwide and it and that movement keeps going so it was really really heartwarming to see like I was here already but just to see that people were raising their voices and there was also a very important change in 2018 in Mexico we finally for the first time in history we uh, we finally have a leftist uh, government uh, which made many many changes labor-wise starting with uh, raising salaries and and you know changes in transparency for unions and it's been really amazing to see that transformation as I was in university we were campaigning for for this change towards the left to happen you know ever since since I was I don't know 
perhaps 16, 17, I was, I, that's when my political activity started and I got into a lot of trouble, but good trouble. So, <laughs> and, uh, and I met who's my partner now, my husband, um, I moved to Canada in 2016 and then, you know, I'll start over because you're a teacher in Mexico and teachers in Mexico, because we are, you know, it's public education and we are very attached to the communities we are serving. It's very common that the teachers are the community advocates. It's given, right? Because you arrive to a new school and the new school needs stuff, right? It needs, it needs electricity and it needs water and it needs, uh, you know, resources to function. And so you become a community organizer almost by default, right? There's no option. You have to continuously be advocating for resources and, and for things to happen. Teachers in Mexico are natural community organizers and community leaders. You have no other choice. So you become uh, someone in the community who is, you know, con in, in contact with the needs of people and continuously, you know, fighting for, for the things to take place. And then, you know, you arrive into a new country and there's nothing around you, right? There's no community, there's no support system other than, you know, of course, my wonderful partner. But yeah, it's a starting over. And of course, not as a public school teacher, because the uh, recognition of credentials in Canada, it's completely flawed. And it's right so unfair that you have to literally start over and retrain yourself although you have worked and you have operated in such complex circumstances that you see you know the work here in a school and you're like I would I will be amazing because all the resources that are there like kids you are not looking for like food for kids you are not like looking for <laughs> pencil for you know you're not just like scratching around for resources everything's given yeah. and there's all this expertise and talent that we bring in but it, it's worth nothing here because you know of course it's worth something but it's not valued right and it's very frustrating just to see how much so many of us migrants could contribute to our communities but we're just not allowed to right due to our place of origin and, and you know the flawed immigration system Absolutely. So I started here. I was given an amazing opportunity at a private school and I'm, I'm, you know, really grateful for my job. It's a great job and I enjoy it because, you know, being a Spanish teacher is also about sharing my culture and also, you know, forcing people to speak your language, which is really cool. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, just kidding. But no, it's really cool to, you know, I teach language and culture. So that's really cool. And it's, it's very fulfilling, but definitely feels like you know, there's so much more that I could give that I'm after six years, I'm still fighting to get, you know, an opportunity teaching different subjects. And uh, I'm sure I'll get there. But really, it takes a lot of, you know, perspective shift, and kind of just being patient. And, and because, you know, teachers, in the private system in Canada, of course, we're not unionized, right? So it becomes very complicated. But to stay connected to my community and to keep up with my political work that I started in Mexico. And um, we started here connecting with the Mexican community because my family and I, we went through some very difficult chapters uh, and incidents of racism when, when we got here. Um, my, my daughter was uh, verbally attacked by a, you know, by a, by a guy who told her to go back to her country. And, oh, and this, no. was, this was in school grounds. And my husband was in a plane for nine hours harassed by white supremacists. And, oh my goodness. You know, just like very difficult stuff. So we thought- When, when like, did you come to Canada? 2016. So oh, okay. that the Trump, the Trump um, wave was at its height, right? So right. it definitely impacted our daily life. They became so emboldened and empowered that they just started, you know, ranting everywhere and, and to everyone. So we thought like we cannot be the only families going through this. So we started connecting with others who were in the same political spectrum as, as us and that supported that change of government in Mexico. And we are started to organize as an association of Mexicans. You know, it was really cool to connect with others who were going through the same things. You know, their children were being told not to speak Spanish at school. And I'm talking 20, 2019, so it's not too long ago, right? But yeah, kids told not to speak their language and, you know, just um, racist comments all around in classrooms and just difficult things that were going on. And so, yeah, we started organizing and 
uh, getting educated on racism and, and you know, anti-racism. And so we consider our organization different from others because we know there are other amazing organizations that promote culture. And you will see that everywhere, like, you know, they're dancing or they're, they're having a party with amazing Mexican food. And, you know, that's a great or day of the death, right? And there are organizations that do this and, and it's amazing, but that's not our approach. We are, you know, social justice oriented, anti-oppression, decolonial, and, and there are certain things that that make our organization different. And we've had support from organizations that have been doing this for a long time. And we decided when COVID started, we decided to focus specifically on migrant farm workers come from Mexico yeah. and, and the Caribbean and, and Central American countries mainly under the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program. And so we devoted all of our time, our efforts, our resources to, first of all, connect with the community of migrant farm workers and establish, you know, a human relationship. And after that, really understanding their, their struggle, understanding their stories, their life stories, and with their permission, start advocating for the changes that they thought were necessary and are continue to be necessary. So we found that really the Seasonal Agriculture Workers Program is Canada's dirty little secret that no one knows about, that no one wants to talk about. And, you know, everyone talks about supporting farmers and supporting, you know, buy local and all of that. But somehow migrant farm workers who are racialized are, you know, erased out of the picture. And, and when people think of a Canadian farmer, they think of a white guy with three or four kids in a picture holding their basket of apples, but th that's not it. I mean, I'm sure there are some. There's racialized, there's uh, migrant workers who are being exploited in a farm near you. And, and, you know, it's just completely erased out of the picture. So our work, it's really about, you know, visibilizing it and hopefully incentivizing some change and talk about some policy change that needs to happen and, and just talk about it nonstop until the Canadian society understands that temporary foreign workers are definitely not a temporary need. They're a permanent need and they should be permanent residents and also citizens because when we found workers, which was very difficult to do because we had to go to all these little towns that are in the remotest areas of Alberta uh, and, you know, just look for them in parking lot of, uh, of a grocery store or the remittance office, shops, things like that. When we found them we learned that some of them have been coming for 25 years and have no right to apply for permanent residency and they have been here for eight months for 25 years and ridiculous. they are not Yes, it is. It's ridiculous. It's abusive. It's exploitative and, and it's advantageous. And, you know, we are all taking advantage of that because if we didn't have migrant farm workers, the prices were, I mean, we're complaining about food prices. Well, imagine if you were paying those workers fair wages and then, you know, we will be in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. I used to work for a company years ago, over 10 years ago, that would help process applications for temporary foreign workers. I mean, given that we're here in Southern Alberta, we would often get applications from uh, workers in Mexico who would try it and apply if working on farms, um, harvesting crops, or even working on feedlots and stuff. And, and, and because of that, like it really changed my perspective on farm work. And so, you know, you often hear people say, oh, did you eat today? Thank a farmer. I've gotten to the point where now I'm saying, did you eat today? Thank a farm worker. Because when it comes down to it, McDonald's, for example, isn't getting all their eggs from a small 10 acre family farm. You know, they're getting it from large producers who hire lots of people to be able to help collect those eggs and take care of the chickens. And a lot of those people aren't born in Canada. They come from other countries. And like you say, on a temporary basis, and someone who, who's been here 20 years might as well be a permanent re resident. They kind of already are. Yeah, of course. And they're basically, they're basically their vacation is in Mexico, right? Not, not here because they're working and living here. And you know, this program was established in 1966 to bring workers from Jamaica to work in farms in Ontario. But very quickly, the agriculture industry realized that this was very profitable because they were not paying for wages and they were basically here as indentured uh, workers. The employers knew that they weren't going to complain because they would yeah. be afraid of getting deported. Yeah, because their, their work permit is tied to one employer. 
and and uh, they're only allowed to work that employer and they basically have a green card to fire the workers whenever like on a whim right so they come from a period of eight months to work in on farms in Canada and the agricultural industry something that we might understand is that it's highly dependent on temporary workers throughout this program uh, over 20 percent of the total employment in this sector is coming from temporary workers so in wow. 2018 approximately 60,000 jobs were filled by migrant farm workers. In right? Alberta or Canada? In Canada. There's over 3,500 farm workers who are just Mexican, but there are many other countries, right? And, and right. you know, they are growing everything you can think of, like potatoes, flowers. We are very connected to workers who do uh, who grow flowers. It's very special to visit the farms and see how proud they are of the beautiful work they do. And yeah. they want to show you the arrangements. They want to show you the, you know, all those Christmas arrangements that you see in, in you know, in supermarkets or, right. you know, the big chains. Well, that's made by someone, right? And, and these are, yeah. like, I know personally that people who, who make these arrangements, right? Like poinsettias by the thousands. Poinsettias wow. are grown by the thousands. Halloween pumpkins, all the Halloween pumpkins you can think of, these are migrant farm workers huh. who are, you know, doing that. All the honey, like we were just talking to a worker who, who's in the honey industry and, and desperately looking for a way to... <sighs> bring his family because these these workers you know you can think of oh, okay so it's not that bad they're just not given permanent residency but that means family separation that means that their family is there eight months a year and they're here right and, and they're in a constant stage of family separation right and you hear all the time people talking about separation of families at the border like in the u.s the u.s mexico border right but canada has been separating families for decades 100% and it's not just like the physical separation but it, these workers are often working in remote rural isolated areas and so that means that you know we've heard from workers that don't have internet for eight months they're not even talking to their families oh for, my goodness for eight months, right like they're paying high, high like very high fees to even talk on the phone with them very remote areas where there isn't even you know a gas station that's how remote it is right and and they are living in the employer's facilities so they often live at the farm or at a place or a trailer that the employer has provided they pay rent but it's you know they can only live there and so this means that many many times places that they live at are very uh, deteriorated right and there's not much they can do about it because there's many things. They're on a closed work permit. They're tied to the employer. There's the language barrier. There's no access to settlement support because, you know, some of your listeners might think, oh, but there's Catholic immigration services and there's newcomers. Well, that, that does not exist in Oyen, Alberta, <laughs> where, there, where there's nothing around a population of 200 people. There is no settlement services there. There's no exactly. one to help them. Right. There is no one to drive them to a doctor's appointment. Like this year, I've been dealing with uh, workers who are having medical problems and like would need to go to the gynecologist and there's a language barrier. So, you know, imagine going to your employer and telling your employer who you rely on for your immigration status and for your wages and, and that your family's living, telling him that you need to go to the gynecologist, right? And, yeah. and imagine being at the doctor's office and your employer having to be there to translate. That's just how vulnerable they are, right? Especially women. And they're prohibited from joining unions or collective bargaining, so that's another thing. There are other provinces where this is possible, very few, and it's been a struggle. But Alberta is decades away from that, wow. especially with the UCP taking power and, and bringing down Bill 6 and bringing in Bill 26 and right. the whole show that, that happened with that. And uh, they're excluded from most occupational health and safety legislation. And they're in a very vulnerable position. The, the complaint system, it's a complaint-driven system, right? So workers right. have to assert their rights to safety and this means that we always offer the option like we can apply for workers compensation board but that means that they're going to go interview your employer that means they need testimony from other workers who wants to get in trouble with the employer right so exactly. it is very difficult to want for people 
for regular people, like to understand the power imbalance that exists in this labor relations, right? Yeah, and, and more than in the regular workplace, like there's more of a power imbalance. Oh yeah, hundred percent. It's astronomical when you know there's the language, there's the remoteness of the areas, there's you know your immigration status tied to one person, and we've had many many complaints of you know even physical abuse and of course verbal and psychological abuse. You know, female workers calling me in the middle of the night to tell me that, you know, we were yelled at and, you know, we we were left like no one opened the house and it was minus 30 and we had to wait here and the employer came laughing and said that we were exaggerating and oh, wow. you know on on mother's day i got a call from from a couple workers who said like we went out for it in their time off and they're saying we went out to celebrate mother's day because of course they're separated from their children so they sure. go on their own to celebrate and the employer is calling them non-stop where are you and who gave you permission to leave the house right what? so they're treated like indentured uh, workers and, and hostages paid, yeah like hostages and paid minimum wage too you know something about minimum wage when covid started um if you can remember canada closed borders immediately right only three days after closing the border they reopen them just for farm workers. Oh my goodness. If I remember correctly, farm workers in Ontario were one of the areas that were hit hardest by COVID-19. Yeah, over 900 workers uh, got sick. And that talks about the living conditions, right? And how they're all cramped in one place. Like, oh, sure. I I've visited places where, you know, there's, there's a trailer, and there's seven, eight, 12 workers living in a trailer, sharing one kitchen, sharing one, you know, four or five people in one bedroom. These are adults, right? Like, can you imagine living with your coworkers at your employer's house? Like, they hold all the power, right? And something that happened in Ontario when, when these workers were sick, it's that they had to start hiring Canadian workers. But instead of paying them $15, which is what migrant workers are paid, they were offering $27 an hour um, wow. for Canadian-born farm workers, which, you know, goes back to solidarity and what you were talking about. Now it's just going to create this, this separation between the two workers, right? Because you're creating different classes of workers and they're not going to be able to stand together in solidarity with one another. That's the origin of racism, isn't it? In the, oh, that's absolutely. That's the origin of racism and it's, yeah. you know, separating, um, you know, all of us. And, and so, yeah, that that's we've been very involved in this work and and doing mostly outreach doing some a few campaigns most importantly campaigns around covid vaccine because when the covid uh, vaccine rollout started agricultural workers were completely left out of the picture it's like they didn't exist no one cares about them right so let's start we're gonna vaccinate you know essential workers oh but farm workers yeah they're too far we we can't we can't reach them Email. they're essential workers so we could get them across the border but not essential workers to get them vaccines yeah and so you know we were emailing politicians telling them like do you realize there's like these many thousand workers who are like living in houses all together they're super vulnerable and if they stop working you know, your supply chain and you know there's a, these are human beings they work here they live here they have the same rights and they were like oh yeah they can book their appointment here in this link and i'm like yeah some of them don't have internet some of them don't speak english some of them don't know how to like you know it asks you for a for alberta health number which they don't have because they pay for a private health insurance they're not even provided with alberta health services Right. So how how the hell are they supposed to just book and go? What well, they're gonna get there and they're gonna have someone explaining all the effects of the vaccine to them and like making an informed decision on the vaccine? You know, yeah, this is one of the problems I had with some of the rhetoric around vaccine hesitancy in the first year or so of the pandemic after the vaccine came out is that people were lumping everybody who wasn't getting a vaccine in together, like vaccine deniers and everything, and not realizing that there was a whole spectrum of people who weren't getting the vaccine for various reasons. And this is one of those reasons, right? Because they were hesitant. They can't speak English. And so the system that they need to book the appointments through is all done in English. They don't have internet, like you're saying, because they're in a different country, uh, as the disease comes out and as the vaccine comes out, they're not getting the information about that vaccine and about the disease. And so they don't really have the information they need. And so it was just really problematic to lump everybody in together when 
realizing that there's a whole spectrum of people for all sorts of different reasons why they weren't getting the vaccine. Yeah, and with some employers who are making choices for them, like I had very heated conversations with some employers who are anti-vaxxers and they were just deciding not to, yeah, we're not getting my workers vaccinated because oh my you know, this and this and this. And I, yeah, they're not your pets. Uh, they're human beings. They're adults. Wow. And they need, you know, they need to make that decision. But they, I personally had very heated com- conversations with many, with many employers who were, you know, against it. And some of them, you know, were receptive. Some of them were not. And of course, there's, you know, the Mexican consulate and a couple settlement agencies came together and did this huge, you know, uh, media campaign where they were getting workers vaccinated but these were like three farms right out of 200 farms oh wow <laughs> so it was a great photo op but <laughs> there were thousands of workers who were not getting that vaccine sure. and and unfortunately you know it's hard to you know receive the support of settlement agencies because our message is you know pro worker and it's you know labor oriented and and it's not very popular with you know establishment right like not very popular with the Mexican consulate who has to maintain certain relationships with the employers and keep this program alive for right. like diplomatic reasons and core settlement agencies you know they have a, this huge ridiculous budget that we will never be part of because we're grassroots right and we run on bake sales and so they were calling us and they were like yeah can you give me a list of your farms and your workers I'm like we've worked so hard to reach out to workers yes I'll give you the list but if you guarantee that they will get the vaccine otherwise you're just using them and this is you know something that happens over and over and, sure. and then they're using grassroots organizing because we're the ones who are in contact with workers right but we never get any credit which i don't care about but these workers are not getting the services either right yeah and they're exploiting your unpaid labor yeah exactly those are paid positions i'm like yeah i want to be paid for like your job is amazing <laughs> like can i be paid but like no i'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, i have a full-time job and i do this you know at evenings and with my husband like it's a family thing it's it's sure. really me, my husband my my teenage daughter and i and i recently had a baby so she's been on the road a few times already nice when I was pregnant I was super active so I was this like crazy loud brown pregnant woman in rural Alberta (laughs) and of course no one was noticing me (laughs) yeah I was very noticeable and we have a few stories like we were chased out of a couple towns by employers and oh wow And, you know, just harassed when we're visiting them. And yeah, it's been interesting. You know, the most fulfilling thing is that we get to listen to their issues and hopefully raise some awareness. But we're so far from policy change because unfortunately, Alberta's NDP won so desperately to win the rural vote that they will never stand against abusive employers. And they don't want to talk about Bill 26 at all because it was so bad for Alberta's NDP that now they're holding back. I was co-chair of the Race Equity Caucus and I just resigned because I just feel that my heart is at community organizing and there's just so much about party politics that I can't stand sometimes and it's important to do both but I just feel that restraining when you know I bring it up in town halls and and it's not very popular when I said that you know farmers need to do better because they treat their workers very badly I'm not very popular (laughs) because they the NDP needs a real vote right so but I thought um, the NDP are the party of labor yeah well uh unionized labor I guess and that's also something that I brought up in our last provincial council and and Rory Gill was there you know people were asking questions and I asked like is there space in the labor movement for workers who are not allowed to be unionized and what are our efforts what are we doing to advocate for those industries and for those areas that are not allowed to be unionized I got a lot of hate not from him but from NDP people who were telling me like yeah now we're gonna be seen as the party that's you know unionizing whatever like let's just stay in our lane and good you know yeah we we yeah we need to be advocating for for these people who are not able to to be unionized for several reasons and something that you know i don't know maybe i don't understand part politics but there's a labor caucus in the ndp but only union members are allowed to be in the labor caucus and perhaps it's cultural i don't know and I've never asked the question because, you know, it sounds like maybe it's a silly question, but I'm wondering, like, aren't all workers supposed to be involved in the labor movement, even if they're not unionized? Like, 
Exactly. Well, I, I mean, when it comes down to it, I don't know what the, the, the stats are in Alberta, but across Canada, only about 30% of workers in the country are unionized. And most of those are public sector unions. And so if yeah. you look at only the private sector, hardly any workers are unionized. And so if we're only going to look at unionized workers, that's leaving a lot of workers out of the discussion. The good news is there's always going to be work for us to do, my husband and I, and everyone who wants to join, because there's always letters to write. There's always, you know, advocacy to do. There's always messaging to get out. Like right now, we're working on three or four cases of workers who uh, want to apply to, um, it's called vulnerable open, uh, vulnerable workers work permit, which is when a temporary foreign worker comes and is abused and is able to gather some evidence, we can build a case and they can apply for an open work permit for one year because oh, wow. they have proof that they have been abused but it's extremely difficult to prove that you, sure. know, you have been abused and all of that yeah, yeah. so you know if there are any lawyers lawyers out there or you know legal aides or anyone who's around that who wants to volunteer we desperately need that and we desperately need also people who are in the healthcare system who help us navigate that healthcare system for workers it's extremely difficult to get the medical attention sometimes they're discriminated against by every single level of the system and it's often us just having a, the, the hardest time getting them closer to services so we always need volunteers who can help us in that area and of course fundraising as i said like we run on bake sales my partner and I were just talking about how we need to fundraise now <laughs> we're in zeros because we operate in all of alberta and the work we do as i said it's not yeah let's promote multiculturalism then we <laughs> cannot apply for grants right like it's really hard to find a grant that will apply to yeah we we want to change the immigration system there are no grants for that so uh, no we need the community support yeah the government's going to give you money to lobby the government <laughs> no yeah no it does not work that way so uh yeah we're, we're we always need help and storage we need storage something it sounds very silly because when people ask me like how can we help and I, i'm like do you have some space in your garage why because, <laughs> <laughs> because we get donations right we get like stuff that we bring to farm workers because you know like winter gear for example right. and we're completely full and sometimes we have to get rid of things like because we don't have more space so yeah storage is a very easy way that you can contribute to the advocacy for migrant farm workers if you're up to it then you come and pick up a few bags of clothes and you hold it for us until you know winter comes and then we will bring it to the workers uh, we're always gathering hygiene products because that's something that, that we put in backpacks we're always gathering you know backpacks in good condition now people are buying backpacks for their children so if they're getting rid of the backpacks and they want to donate it to us then we will take them and we will fill them with winter gear and hygiene products and things like that and then we go to rural alberta uh, and we deliver them in, in various farms right that's awesome great so um, yeah, thanks for sharing that life story with us. Uh, so at this point, I usually ask my guests, how has your intersections of marginalization ever influenced your experiences as a worker? And I think you've kind of already touched on that, especially with other workers other than yourself, but is there anything more that you'd like to add on that point? You know, when I introduce myself, I always say I am a woman, I am brown, I am a migrant. I am from the working class. I cannot afford it to be out of politics. My life is political and everything I do and I say is highly political. It's just who I am. You know, everything we do, everything we fight for, it's related to our marginalizations and it's, you know, our intersections of marginalization. And of course, I've come to understand that I have great privilege. I'm able-bodied, I'm cisgender, and, you know, I'm married. I wasn't a work permit for a long time, but I'm now a, a Canadian citizen. So it's also about, you know, checking my own privilege and trying to see through the lens of those who are still struggling to stay afloat in this very unfair immigration system that uses, abuses, and disposes people, and just constantly keep on learning from from workers and also from new generations that have different ways of organizing i have a teenage daughter she's 14 and you know just staying in touch with what the new generations are bringing to the fight it's always interesting to hear of you know their methods and their ways of communication and all of that always being aware of my own privilege but um staying also aware of how fragile is everything that we've earned and it can be taken away 
so easily. And something that I remember is my husband, when he was harassed on that flight that I mentioned before, that was his first time flying as a Canadian citizen. And he was really excited. He was like, oh, I'm a Canadian citizen now. Like, I'm no gonna more be, problems. I'm going to be treated this and this way. <laughs> yeah, nobody. <laughs> no, <laughs> we are brown, you know, brown and proud, but we are brown and we're going to be treated as racialized people forever. And, you know, just solidarity, right? Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? Yeah, just, uh, I guess, if we could invite your listeners to follow the struggle of migrant farm workers and learn about how they live and how much work they do and for how long they've been doing it. And, you know, it's not enough to vote for the left. It's also about praxis. It's also about going out and doing the work. And sometimes doing the work means preparing some backpacks and, you know, going on the road. And it does not seem very revolutionary, but it actually is like working with farm workers for me is the most hardcore thing that one can do in, you know, especially in a place like Canada, where it's minus 40, and you have to, you know, go out and and do these things and do it without resources. So if anyone wants to join us, we will be very happy to have you and your time to at least spread the awareness on all of those issues. Great. Thank you. Uh, where can people follow you and your work? I'm on Facebook and my Facebook page is Vanessa, V-A-N-E-S-A-O-R-T-I-Z, Vanessa Ortiz, uh, YYC. Uh, that's my Instagram as well. I'm not very active on Instagram, but I'm, I'm very active in Facebook. Uh, our email is Mexicanos, like M E X. I-N-O-S, Calgary at gmail.com, Mexicanos Calgary. Uh, you can email us there. And hopefully this winter, we're going to be ready to go out and, and do some of the work. So join us. Awesome. I'll be sure to include that in the episode description for anybody who's listening to this on a podcast app. And I'll also be sure to put it on our website as well. Uh, if people are interested in following the Alberta Worker, you can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can also visit our website at albertaworker.ca. Once you're there, you might as well sign up for our newsletter. We have daily, weekly, and monthly issues. And if you like this episode, feel free to rate and review the Alberta Worker podcast. We are appreciative of all the listeners. And if you are interested in supporting the Alberta Worker, you can visit albertaworker.ca slash support. Alberta Worker depends on funding from readers and listeners just like you. If you're interested in being a guest on the Alberta Worker, you can email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for joining us today. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. And as always, solidarity. Solidarity.